Desperate for a way to pass the time, people embraced a desperate form of entertainment, one that could last as long as nine months. Marathon dancing had been around since the early 20s. Back then, it was part of the craze to establish endurance records. Gertrude Utterly swam the English Channel. There were tree sitters, people who sat in trees. There were flagpole sitters. Some man pushed a peanut up Pike's Peak with his nose. I mean, people were trying to express, you know, what is the limit of, of the human body as a machine. At first, dancers moved non-stop to recorded music for more than 24 hours at a time. But promoters soon found a way of extending the contests indefinitely by changing the rules. By the Depression, those rules were generally 45 minutes of dancing and 15 minutes of rest, 24 hours a day, round the clock. And they feed you seven times a day on a table that rolls out on the floor. So you can eat seven times. I thought, gee, they feed you. That was pretty good. During the Depression, marathon dancing took on a whole new character. It became hugely popular. People looking for cheap entertainment found it at the dance halls. 25 cents to get in, a dollar a night, and you could stay for hours. It became far more than an endurance contest. Marathon dances evolved into live soap operas, heated dramas of romance, survival, and danger and full of gimmicks to keep the customers coming back. At one marathon, a man hung upside down for several days. There was something called Frozen Alive in which a contestant would volunteer to be entombed in a huge block of ice. And this was all dramatized. The promoter would go up to the ice and hold the microphone against it and say, you know, are you frozen yet? Can you still breathe? And of course, the contestant would have a flashlight and, and signal with the light. The most popular promotion was a wedding staged on the dance floor. The lucky couples were thrown lavish ceremonies complete with, in this case, cellophane gowns. Some of these weddings were legitimate, but by no means all. Sometimes they were married by real ministers and had to get a divorce, and sometimes they weren't. Polite society was scandalized by dance marathons, suspecting that the prizes were rigged, as they often were, and that more than resting was going on during the breaks, as it often was. One contestant, Stan West, told me that he loved to seduce women in the audience and that he would try to get them to go outside with him for 15 minutes during his rest break instead of going to the, to the boys' quarters. Fortunately or unfortunately, it was a very quick event. Unfazed, the fans kept on coming back to the dance halls. They became a haven for out-of-work entertainers. Red Skelton was an MC for a time when vaudeville dried up. Jazz diva Anita O'Day performed for the first time at a marathon. And I just said, I know a tune called The Lady in Red. Do you think I could sing it some night, you know? And they let me sing The Lady in Red. And the people in the audience throw money on the floor. Everybody helps pick it up. They put it in your pocket, take it in the back room, put it in your suitcase, and you're beginning to save your money. You're beginning to learn to sing with the band. Then there were those who danced out of hunger. Food was plentiful, six or seven meals a day, and contestants got a place to sleep, if only for 15 minutes at a time. Popular couples would find local sponsors. Audience members would throw coins at their favorite dancers. This was called a silver shower. Well, it's money. You put it in the pocket, you put it in the drawer in the back, and by the time you leave, you got a hundred bucks in change. <laughs> and of course, there was the prize money, a thousand dollars or more that awaited the last couple on their feet. The lure of the prizes and sometimes the fear of a return to homelessness kept the dances going on for months at a time. The longest, in Chicago, lasted from August 1930 to April 1931, more than nine months. Deep into a marathon, it became surreal. Dancers actually asleep on their feet and suffering hallucinations. 
going squarely, it was called. Like the weddings, it was often feigned. Contestants very soon learned that spectators liked the idea of kind of temporary madness. So at one show, a man was picking daisies as if he was in a field. I think the line between what was performed and what was in fact really going on was often very blurry.